Okay. Hello, everybody, and uh, welcome to last weekly Westdoc webinar series. As you by now probably know, Westdoc aimed to bring together leaders on sustainable water and environmental research from around the globe and students and in general audiences who are interested in making difference and learn about this field. Uh, here is a, the organizing committee, Abhishek, Fuhar, myself, Kar and Freya from University of British Columbia and Jaskaran who joins us from University of Guelph. Uh, like I said, uh, we wanted to bring uh, international audiences uh, from this Westdoc webinar series, which is a joint collaboration between IC Impact and UBC Future Water. And both centers are based in University of British Columbia. And uh, on behalf of our organizing committee, I would like to say that we are happy that we accomplished or goal and here this the map shows that our global outreach every week that we had these webinar talks uh, we ask our audiences to log in their location and this map basically shows the um, where our audiences logged in from or called in from and uh, if you miss uh, the past uh, seminars webinars you can find it in our IC impact channel on YouTube and uh, here is the list of the speakers or international and uh, global speakers. And today is, we are gonna end the weekly webinar uh, series by Dr. Pinto from Northeastern University, who is gonna talk about the metabolic landscape of drinking water microbiome. And next week, uh, this webinar series, we're gonna end with uh, best talk conferences. And I would like to ask Carr as the chair of the organizing committee for West conference to talk about the, this conference bit. Take it away, Carr. Yeah, thanks. So I, uh, I think many of you have gotten my emails in the past, but I just want to one more time remind you. So yes, West Talks is after a year. We've been going since July, early July of last year. Um, this is the last regular Thursday morning West Talks, but we have three uh, keynote speakers part of the West Conference next week. So they will be the three um, final West Talks scholars, we'll call them, West Talks presenters. Um, so registration is free for the West Conference, and, and there's a link I'll post it in the chat box in a second. Um, so if you haven't already, please do register for the West Conference. We actually have a, a pretty fantastic lineup over three days of keynotes, of education sessions, panels. We're having a virtual banquet where we will send you a $30 Uber Eats gift card. So registration is free, and we are literally sending you a Uber Eats gift card to attend our virtual banquet and a, uh, a water industry showcase. So please do sign up if you haven't already um, and uh, you can reply back to the emails uh, from West Talks with any questions, but uh, that'll be the, the final West Talks, at least for now. So, all right, thanks, Louie. Yes, sir. And with that, I would like to introduce Dr. Pinto um, the, or today's speaker. Dr. Pinto is an environmental engineer and assistant prof in civil and environmental engineering at Northeastern University in Boston, um, USA. Amit is a chemical engineer from Institute of Chemical Technology, University of Mumbai, with postgraduate degrees in environmental engineering from the University of Alaska and Virginia Tech. Prior to joining Northeastern University in 2016, he was a lecturer, senior lecturer at the University of Glasgow. His research has received support through prestigious grants like EPSRC's uh, Bright Ideas Award in 2015 and the NSF Career Award in 2018 and 2019 Paul L. Bosch Award for Innovation in Applied Water Quality Research. And its research focuses on development and application of state-of-the-art molecular and modeling tools to monitor and manage the microbiology of drinking water system to improve the sustainability of treatment processes and enhance the safety and security of drinking water. With that, I would like to um, welcome uh, Dr. Pinto and please take it away. And for the or audience, if you have any question, please post your question in chat box and we are gonna have a, a Q&A session at the end of the talk. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much for that introduction. And I'm going to make sure that my slides are open and they are right here. So share. And just let me know if you can see the presenter view, okay? 
how about now? Can you see the presenter view or like? Yeah, right now okay. we can see the presenter. So it looks good. All right, so it's awesome uh, to be here uh, virtually in Vancouver. Um, and uh, it's, it's fantastic that this uh, the series you all have put together and seeing such global participation is really quite remarkable. Uh, you know, it's, it speaks for um, it speaks for the quality of program you put together. And I'm not saying this because I'm giving a talk today, but I've seen all the, all the distinguished speakers you brought on board here. And it's amazing. It's, it's a great forum to share uh, incredible work going on um, uh, across the world in the water field. So I'm super excited to be invited here and, and have an opportunity to share the work that we're doing um, uh, at Northeastern University. Um, and I'm gonna talk to you today about the metabolic landscape of the drinking water microbiome, um, and um, yeah, I'll, I'll I'll get get to it slowly. Um, you know, if just a couple notes over here. Um, if um, you know, you can if you want to know more about my website, uh, you, my research group, and web, uh, you can you can check out my website over here. Um, can you see my mouse when I move it? You can. Okay, that's cool. And if you want to see a mix of science and cats, you can. Follow me on Twitter at Water Microbe. Um, so, um, you know, in our research group, we um, we tend to think of ourselves uh, as um, um, as a group of researchers who do theory-inspired combination of experimental and computational approaches for water engineering applications. Now, that's very aspirational. I'm not going to say we live up to it every semester, but certainly this is what we this is what we try to pursue. And by theory, I'm talking about a mix of um, ecological theory. Uh, sort of uh, physiology of microorganisms. And then also, um, you know, that, that then blends with experimental work, whether that's field related work, whether that's um, uh, laboratory based reactor work. And, you know, we bring it all together on the computational side of things to see whether the hypothesis that we went with, whether, whether that worked out or even sometimes, um, you know, it's, it's, it's an exercise of data mining to develop hypotheses. Um, so that's sort of three pillars that my research group kind of stands on. And uh, our, you know, the sort of um, the environment of the theater that we play in is the engineered water cycle. Um, so we are interested in microbial communities in the urban urban water cycle. I should change that now. It's, it, um, you know, um, I've, I've meant to change that now for a while. Uh, it's the microbial communities in the engineered water cycle and not necessarily urban water cycle, but at the interface of environment, infrastructure and health. So it doesn't matter where you are across this continuum uh, that we, we think about sort of water continuum, whether it's uh, withdrawal of natural water, drinking water treatment, water treat treatment and water distribution and use, sewers, wastewater treatment and discharge. There are microorganisms every, everywhere you look. And depending on where you are, the microbial context and impact can be very, very different. So we care about microorganisms on the drinking water side for a much different reason than we care about them on the wastewater side. Um, so the vision, vision of our research group is to try to create these microbial management frameworks to maximize the benefit and minimize the detriment of microbial communities. So the strategies or the frameworks that we use to control microbial communities on the drinking water side of things might in fact be very, very different from the ones that we use to control them on the wastewater or the stormwater side of things. Um, so currently the projects in my lab are largely on the drinking water um, I, you know, stormwater, maybe a little bit, not as much, and then a little bit on the uh, waste, uh, wastewater side of things. So we look at microbial communities using, using a combination of molecular tools. Um, we also develop some sensing platforms to, to look at these microbial communities. And I'm happy to talk about any of those topics at a later point in time. But today I'm going to focus on the drinking water microbiome. Um, and uh, so I'm sure there are lots of environmental engineers and water engineers in this in in, uh, in the audience here. So it's 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 sort of, it's sort of like um, you know um, uh, this is not new information, but it kind of helps put things in context, right? So when I talk about uh, drinking water, I am not necessarily talking only about the water we drink. Drinking water comes into our homes um, and is used for a range of different applications. Right, so the average American household uses about 138 gallons of water every day. These are statistics from about 2016, uh, and these are used for in the toilet, for the shower, in, in, in the shower, in faucets. We lose a decent amount through leaks. Uh, so there is there is a whole bunch of different applications 
uh, where drinking water is used. Now, if I take, um, um, if I do some basic mass balance and I try to assess how many microorganisms are we getting exposed to uh, based on simple uh, sort of um, the numbers that I see in Boston. And particularly if I limit it to showering, if I limit it to a faucet, which is drinking and bath, these are three exposure hours, right? Um, we're talking about 3 billion microorganisms on a daily basis. So this is not a massively large number, but it's still quite substantial. Um, um, and, we, and we care about these microorganisms. Um, when we try to think about this microbial community and this microbial ecosystem, uh, as environmental engineers, what we know is that the drinking water ecosystem is actually quite extensive, right? We can see what emerges at the tap, but that those microorganisms in that shower head or those microorganisms in, in that glass of water have actually taken quite the journey, right? And they have traveled from the source waters through a range of different treatment processes and then miles of miles of pipes to get into our homes. So this is, this is quite an interesting group of microorganisms that has journeyed, that has migrated into our homes and they can have a certain set of impacts or they can, they can uh, affect us in a certain, a certain amount of ways. So what do we do as engineers? As engineers, what we're trying to do is we're trying to manage these microbial communities that are in tap water through, you know, if I was to take all the different technologies out there and I, uh, for biological control, for biological control, and I was, was to put, put them in two different bins, right? Um, most of these technologies from a microbial control side of things are either meant to kill the microorganisms, disinfection to remove or inactivate micro, microbes, whether it's chlorine, whether it's UV, whether it's ozone, or it's processes that restrict their growth. And restrict their growth means they remove takeaway substrate that's available for microbial growth. So what I'm gonna do like in the next few seconds is just walk through this arbitrary plot of what life looks like for a microorganism potentially as it moves from the source water into our premises plumbing. And on the y-axis you have concentration. And this is concentration of substrate, something a microorganism might use to grow. And this is concentration of a disinfectant, something that is harsh for a microorganism. So as the, uh, let me go back, as the water moves from the, from the source water into the treatment process, what we're seeing is successive reduction in the substrate available for microbial growth. Now that substrate is not just carbon, it could be nitrogen, it could be fuel, you know, it could be phosphorus, for instance, depending on the type of source water that's being treated. And then, you know, that's once the treatment is done, it stays fairly constant, fairly low rather, unless there's something happens in the distribution system. There could be leaks, there could be ingress, there could be biofilms sloughing off and then into the premise plumbing. So we've substantially reduced what's available for microorganisms to grow on. At the same time, in most parts of the world, we then dose in a disinfectant. And in Boston, uh, we dose in cl uh, chlorine and then convert it to chloramine. And then as the chloramine moves to the distribution system, it kind of starts decaying a little bit until in the premise plumbing, you have none. So what you're seeing is that the microorganism is moving across a gradient, where is these two factors or microbial community is moving across this continuum, whereas these two factors that are at play substrate availability and uh, sort of chemical stress. And despite this, despite the fact that there is so much done to control this microbial community, what we know from a lot of the work that's done is these microbial communities are immense, you know, are quite diverse. I'm not gonna say they're as diverse as rivers. I'm not gonna say they're as diverse as what's in, in a gut microbiota, for instance, but they are still relatively diverse. We find, you know, this is a paper uh, by uh, one of my uh, past students where she took, took a look at uh, a 16S ribosomal RNA gene sequences that were in the public database uh, from drinking water systems, try to get a sense of the diversity of these microorganisms. And, you know, all, you know the take home message from this is the more branches you see over here, this is a distinct set of microorganisms being seen in different drinking water treatment systems. Now, um, and this is based on 16S ribosomal RNA gene, which is a marker that's conserved in most, uh, most bacteria and archaea. Um, we, can, we can move those methods and we can now use methods that use, for example, metagenomic sequencing that are not relying on markers. And we can still see it's not just bacteria in our drinking water systems. And I want you to ignore the x-axis here for now. I will come back to this later. It's not just bacteria in our drinking water systems. We also see archaea, 
and we see eukaryotes, right? So it's, it's a diverse microbial community that manages to survive everything that we threw at it before to try to, and, and gets to our tap. It's also relatively abundant. And you know, when I say it's abundant, again, on a relative scale, typically what we see is we see about 1,000 to 100,000 cells in every milliliter of tap water. In Boston, we see maybe about 10,000 to 50,000 cells in every milliliter of tap water. Um, uh, and this is, you know, it's not huge. It's nowhere close to lakes and rivers or even wastewater, but you know, it's, it's reasonable uh, to groundwater. So if I now take these numbers and I talked about this before, take these numbers and I put this onto the microorganisms coming into our homes for all these different uses, about 30 billion microbes approximately on a daily basis enter our home. And about 3 billion of them we are exposed to either via, for example, aerosols to, through drinking or through skin exposure. So why do we care about this microbial community? One of the primary reasons we care about them is that their potential to cause disease, right? So. Uh, there are, you know, we, we tend to think of, uh, you know, um, uh, microorganisms like, you know, um, that can cause sort of uh, GI issues, just crypto and um, giardia and some other microorganisms that are not as a huge issue now as they used to be. But there are a new set of microorganisms that are really quite, quite an issue, right? So these are, these are microorganisms like, um, uh, Legionella, these are microorganisms like uh, a non tuberculosis mycobacterium, and diseases associated with it have gone up quite significantly over the last, last several years. So, this is number of cases of Legionellosis. Now, these are not all attributable to drinking water itself, but the numbers have seen a steady increase over the last decade or so. And at the same time, that's true with, for example, NTM infections also. Um, um, and so, and this is not limited to one country or the other. So for example, this, da this data over here is from the United States. Here you're seeing data from, from South Korea. So waterborne infections continue to rise and the costs associated with them also keep going up. So there was a really nice, um, a really interesting study that was published by the CDC earlier. This is from January of 2021, I believe. Yeah, that's right. It's from January of 2021, where they try to summarize what, are, what is the, uh, burden and direct healthcare co costs of infectious waterborne diseases just in the United States, right? And um, what they estimate is that every year in the United States, there is about 7 million waterborne illnesses, um, which result in about 6,000 deaths. And the sort of direct cost, direct healthcare cost is about 3.33 billion, right? That is just a direct cost that is not attributed to the lost economic activity and productivity from when people get sick. So you can compound that substantially to sort of estimate what's happening. In fact, just a few pathogens such as myco, pseudomonas and Legionella alone account for about 2.39 billion. So it's, it's not trivial, trivial sums of money or trivial economic impacts that we're talking about. Um, so we care about the water microbiome or we care about microorganisms and drinking water systems uh, because they can cause healthcare impacts. What they can also cause is other impacts that we still, you know, I would say that we don't have a really great handle on it in terms of how much is that microbial activity responsible for infrastructure damage in terms of corrosion. Now there are studies that demonstrate uh, that certain microorganisms are responsible for pitting corrosion, for instance. Um, um, there are certain studies that demonstrate that microorganisms are responsible for impacts on aesthetic quality of water. But I would say that, you know, potentially those, those numbers are not as well quantified as the disease perspective. And that's because we've been very, very focused on disease. So if I, you know, if I take a look at the trend in the drinking water field over the last 20 years, um, and I, you know, and one way for me as, you know, and this is probably a very, very narrow point of view as the researcher, what's, what's helpful for me to see is how many publications have there been in a particular area in the drinking water side. So it kind of tells me what is driving research. And so, you know, I, on the Y axis, you have publications from 1990 to 2021. And on the X axis, you have, what I've done is I've used a combination of words, drinking water and pathogen drinking water, coliform, crypto, da, 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 all the way to microbial ecology. And what you see is we have been very, very pathogen centric in the drinking water field. And that's for good reason, because we have a really good handle on how much these pathogens cost us, 
right? And so we've focused on them. And the reason I'm using that time frame 1990 onwards is because truly in the sort of in 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 in, um, in the truest sense, molecular methods that relied on non-culture based approaches in the drinking water field really started taking off right around uh, late 1980s, early 1990s. Uh, and this this means methods that use DNA or RNA or some other approach to look at microorganisms that doesn't rely on culturing them. So certainly we care about the microbiome. We care about the um, microorganisms and drinking, drinking water community. And my goal today here is to, in the remaining part of my talk, is to try to convince you that we need to look beyond just pathogens, right? Um, you know, my thesis is that pathogen centric, being pathogen centric and not microbiome inclusive is a lost opportunity, right? Bec we have largely focused, as these publications will kind of tell you, largely focus on things that drive disease, but not the microbial community as a whole. And this is where the, the title of my talk is looking at the metabolic landscape of the drinking water microbiome is quite important. We need to expand how we look at microorganisms in drinking water systems. We need to expand how we under contextualize microorganisms in drinking water systems. And that can then drive innovative technology development. And I'll, I'll come to that in a little bit. So um, for the rest of the talk, I'm gonna talk about the microbiome, not necessarily its impacts, but what are the factors that shape the drinking water microbiome? So what do we do as engineers um, and environmental microbiologists uh, within the drinking water context. We do two things, you know, um, um, broadly. We monitor these microorganisms, and then we, do, uh, we design technologies, we implement management practices and treatment approaches that manage these microbial communities. And depending on where I am in this continuum from source to tap, that process of either managing the microbiome or monitoring the microbiome can move across this arbitrary scale from easy to difficult, right? It can move, uh, move across that scale. And that's purely a matter of logistics. So in the source water, it's easy to monitor. Management is quite challenging because then you're, you're essentially uh, managing a watershed in a sense. Drinking water treatment plant is quite easy to both manage and monitor. In the distribution system, management is quite difficult because most of the water that you're monitoring is in pipes that are buried inside the ground. So, when we think about how to use information about microbiome to influence both monitoring and management, I think this is something that we kind of have to keep in mind. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to focus on one aspect of how we manage the drinking water microbiome and give an example of a study that we did. It's a couple of papers are now published just last year and some, and, and, uh, some, some uh, will be out soon. Uh, what, you know, is how is one particular treatment approach that we're using, how is it changing the microbiology of our drinking water systems? How are changing uh, uh, the microbial community in our drinking water system? And can we then link those changes that we see to some metabolic traits of those microbial communities? Is there, is there any sense over there? And so I'm gonna, I'm gonna focus largely on disinfection uh, for today. Uh, so disinfection is very, very common. It's used in most of the world. Um, and what, it, what it's meant to do is it's meant to reduce the microbial, con the concentration of microorganisms in water that's going from the treatment plant into the distribution system. And disinfection, you know, we use very, very, very strong oxidants such as, um, you know, chlorine or chloramine. And the question we wanted to ask was that is disinfection, is, it, is, is the way it is acting on the microbial community, is that selection systematic? That means, is it or random? And I'm gonna provide some context here. When I mean systematic, what I mean is, is it biologically systematic? Is it metabolically systematic? That means, is it selecting for microorganisms with certain metabolic traits? When I say random, what I mean is maybe, maybe microbes are purely surviving because of mass transfer effects, right? Microorganisms inside clumps of biofilm, maybe the ones on the inside survive and the ones on the outside don't survive because they're exposed. So this is what we wanted to kind of pursue. Now, there is one, being, one way of doing this, and one way of doing this is looking at the data that's published. But drink, 
uh, published before and try to mine that data to see if you can uh, get some meaningful signal from it to differentiate between systematic and random. Uh, that's a little bit challenging because uh, you know the drinking water field is very, very data poor. If I go to IMG, this is, uh, you know, and this is using approaches such as metagenomics that gives us information beyond who's there. It gives us information about what their functional potential is. If you take a look at all the metagenomes that are out there, drinking water is like a small, small fraction. When we published this paper, I think uh, about two years ago, only about 0.03% of all DNA sequencing data that was in the public databases came from drinking water systems, right? So it's a very small fraction. So there was no way that we could mine this data to systematic, systematically ask questions. And we had been thinking about this for a while and what we decided to do, and this was even, this is some of the stuff we did even before uh, I moved from the UK, is we start, we wanted to see whether we could generate our own data, whether we could sample full scale systems with and without disinfectant residuals to then do a reasonable amount of uh, genomics, metagenomics and statistics to try to tease out if there are particular differences. Now, what's interesting over here is in the United Kingdom, uh, water is distributed with a disinfectant residual. In the Netherlands, however, since the 1970s or 80s, I don't know precisely, uh, water is distributed without a disinfectant residual. So if you open a tap in the Netherlands, it's not going to have measurable chlorine at all. Whereas in the United States, if you don't have measurable chlorine in the tap, then that's a big problem. The same in the United Kingdom. So what we did was we said, let's go and sample these systems. Let's use a consistent set of protocols. So then we can compare these samples well. You know, we can compare these samples, right? And so uh, before I get into any further, you know, uh, you know, what we did was we packed up a lab and you can see a lab in a bag and we hopped on trains and, uh, and we went from, in some cases, Airbnbs to Airbnbs. Uh, homes of people we knew, and we sampled water, right? Uh, uh, and we did a bunch of you know, water quality analysis on site, and then we brought it back to the lab. And over here, like Melina, Maria, Melina, they did a lot of the work. Uh, uh, Dot was involved, and in, Dot also led some of this work as well. And the reason we could do in the Netherlands is because of uh, collaborators like Paul van der Wielen, who works at the KWR Water Cycle Institute. So most of the work that we did during that time is now in these um, two citations that are there, and you're happy to look them up. Um, but I'm going to talk through it now. So what you'll notice, I go one slide back, is these are systems that are spread across. So they are drinking water systems that have different source waters. These are drinking water systems that have different treatment processes. These are drinking water systems that have different distribution systems and premises plumbing. So there is an immense amount of heterogeneity in the drinking water systems that we are comparing. The only difference from here to here, consistent difference, is presence versus absence of a disinfectant residual. That's the primary difference that's driving. A lot of uh, treatment process and a lot, lot of variation that's going on. So what did we see? So let me talk through this. Um, what you're seeing over here is comparison of metagenomes between two sampling locations. And, as the, and each row or column is a particular metagenome. And as we go from light, uh, as we go from a light to dark color, they become more different from each other. So we initially compared those metagenomic reads, the short reads that come from sequencing, and what we and um, let me back up. And the golden labels are disinfected systems. Oh, sorry about that. The golden labels are disinfected systems, and the blue labels are non-disinfected systems. What we're seeing from this particular analysis is that disinfected systems tend to look more similar to each other and non-disinfected systems tend to look more similar to each other than they do to disinfected systems. This is where we're looking at individual reads that have been sequenced from these metagenomes. If we now assemble those reads into, into what we call scaffolds or context, so we get much, much more improved uh, uh, sort of genetic or genomic information or genetic information, the signal becomes even a lot clearer where the disinfected systems look way similar to each other than they do to non-disinfected systems. And non-disinfected systems tend to look much more similar to each other than they do disinfected systems. What we also wanted to do is because all subsequent analysis are now gonna be based on this where we've stitched together short reads to long reads, what we wanted to make sure was that we didn't lose information during that process that's called metagenomic assembly. So if I take those mass distances, 
uh, from scaffolds, these are the numbers encoded here, and from reads, these are the numbers encoded here. You know, what we're seeing is there is really minimal loss of information because there is strong correlation. So if we work now with assemblies rather than reads, we're quite sure that we're still carrying forward the difference. Now, what's interesting over here is that the, I would call this the microbial community structure level comparisons. About 17% of the difference between disinfected and non-disinfected systems could be attributed to the presence or absence of a disinfectant residual. This is in the background of a lot of variability between systems, right? So that's quite significant. What we can then do is take these scaffolds and we can annotate reads on these particular, annotate genes on these particular scaffolds, genes that code for certain functional information. What is this gene responsible for? You know, is it for carbon degradation? Is it for nitrogen uh, assimilation? Is it for nitrification? All of these different processes. And we identify these genes and we do the same thing over here. Color goes from light to dark, they become more similar or different from each other. And again, disinfected systems look much more similar to each other than they do non-disinfected systems and the other way around. What we can do is we can look at all identified genes, but the challenge is that, you know, many times we can't tell, we can tell that something is a gene, but we can't tell what it does, right? So we can, if we now restrict the analysis to only the genes that have a functional annotation, what we can see is that variation is, you know, that clustering is still conserved. In fact, if we now move forward, and just focus on annotated proteins, proteins that tell us what the functions are involved, we are pretty confident that we will not lose a lot of information when we compare disinfected and non-disinfected systems. So this is the distance, y-axis from this plot, x-axis from this plot, strong correlation, we're not gonna lose a lot of information. Whereas at the structure level, about 17% of the variation can be attributed to presence absence of disinfectant, at the functional potential level, it was only about 7%. Again, this is in the background of a lot of heterogeneity. And it is not surprising that we went down from 70 to 7% because a lot of core metabolic processes are conserved across bacteria, right? So, um, you know, um, and so losing that information is not surprising. So that's, that's one thing. One thing that we know is irrespective of how much heterogeneity is between these systems, they cluster separately from each other. So disinfectant plays a role. Now let's see how much variability we might see. You know, it, it, let's move from just clustering to variability within systems. What I'm doing in this plot, this is structure-based. What I'm doing in this plot is comparing all disinfected systems against each other. Over here, I'm comparing all non-disinfected systems against each other. And over here, I'm comparing disinfected and non-disinfected systems. And what this kind of tells me is disinfected systems at the structure level, are significantly less variable than non-disinfected systems. And at the same time, disinfected and non-disinfected systems are more different from each other. This kind of comes back to the previous, previous plots. But again, why is this why is this information important over here? The fact that disinfected systems on the whole show less variability than non-disinfected system means that there is likely a systematic selection pressure being imposed at the taxonomic level on the microbial communities and disinfected systems. If you move to the functional level, the signal becomes even stronger. At the functional level, disinfected systems are even more similar to each other than they are to non-disinfected systems. So what the case I'm trying to build over here slowly is not only does the presence or absence of disinfectant residual make these systems different, but that the presence of a disinfectant residual makes those systems more similar to each other right? So if you go from one disinfected system to another, you will see rest, less variability than if you go from one non-disinfected system to another. So that's at the community level. What we can do when we use this approach is now you assemble genomes of microorganisms that are in there and then try to assess, is there, are there signals that we see at the genomic level? Because I started this talk talking about metabolic landscape and we can speak about the metabolic landscape in the community context, What's actually a lot more exciting is to think about the metabolic landscape at the genome level, the genome resolved metabolic landscape. So we took all this, this data and we assembled the genomes of microorganisms in these systems. The kind of crazy thing that kind of stuck out to us is, is in disinfected systems, the average genome size of microorganisms is actually a lot larger than it is in non-disinfected systems. 
So even though we are seeing what appears to be some sort of selection towards less structurally and functionally diverse microbial community, the genome size is larger, so their metabolic repertoire is likely also much larger, right? Than, uh, than non-disinfected systems. Now, when we saw this, we were quite surprised and we said, you know what? There is a certain group of microorganisms called Patesi bacteria, which are, which are known for really reduced genomes that we only see in the disinfected systems. Let's, let's remove them from our analysis and see whether that signal still stands. And so we take them out and you can see this uh, little lump over there, but the signal still stands is that the average genome size in the disinfected systems is much larger than in a non-disinfected systems, suggesting that disinfection is selecting for a similar set of expanded metabolic capacities at the genome level, which is kind of interesting, right? So we, we then started digging around and saying, let's, let's take a look, let's see what are those metabolic capacities. And if you work with metagenomic data, it can be, there's so much information in here that sometimes it's difficult to kind of um, build 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 a story. So what I'm going to do over here is just focus on one one particular pretty interesting insight that we had, and that is that we compared some really closely phylogenetically close related microorganisms that we found in both disinfected systems and non-disinfected systems, and then try to say what are the pathways that are differentially uh, differentially enriched in disinfected versus non-disinfected systems. And what's again stuck out to us quite surprisingly is there are pathways associated with, um, with the glyoxylate shunt, right? And so glyoxylate shunt is this, this particular pathway that is uh, sort of activated when you're using sort of non-traditional carbohydrate sources, non-traditional carbon sources. So what you're trying to do is you're trying to, uh, trying to sort of skip a, a certain parts of the cent cent central carbon metabolism uh, because because you know uh, it's uh, um, uh, there's some amount of energy conserved when you when you kind of do that. So the glyoxylate shunt seems very uh, seems highly uh, disproportionately enriched. Pathways associated with reuse of fatty acids were highly enriched in disinfected in genomes of disinfected microorganisms compared to non-disinfected microorganisms, and pathways associated with the reuse of amino acids. So what this this kind of told us that maybe disinfected microorganisms are kind of good at using non-traditional carbohydrates, right? Non-traditional carbon sources, whether that carbon comes from fatty acids, whether that carbon comes from amino acids, you know, if they don't have to synthesize these macromolecules, but then maybe repair and reuse them, and maybe some of that then goes into, into, into the central metabolism, that is awesome. So what is the potential hypothesis that, that this kind of fits into? And then it kind of struck us that, what if, because there is disinfection, uh, in disinfected systems, microorganisms are presumably dying at a higher rate. What if microorganisms who are able to reuse those decay products have a slight advantage? So microorganisms that are involved in necrotrophic growth, that means these are microorganisms that don't have to start with acetyl-CoA, but microorganisms that can skip certain steps, save energy, and reuse what is being released by other decaying microorganisms for growth. So this is an important aspect is like, you know, thinking about what is the role of necrotrophic growth. So when I speak about meta metabolic landscape, this is, you know, this is potentially a lifestyle, uh, you know, how, how does that play in? So we can, we can kind of go a little bit further and now think, start thinking about implications. And, you know, we were always quite interested in uh, sort of what happens to things like antibiotic resistance. You know, antibiotic resistance is not necessarily a huge issue in drinking water systems, at least as far as I know. Um, um, but it's still an interesting trait to kind of look after uh, because that might tell us what kind of microorganisms we are, we are selecting for. So uh, what one of my students did is that she started looking at what happens to resistance traits in drinking disinfected and non-disinfected drinking water systems. And here you have disinfected, here you have non-disinfected systems, and here are the microbial communities and the colors correspond to, you know, at, this is at the broad grouping of uh, at the, almost the phylum level, but uh, we're looking at what happens to these microbial communities, you know, who's present and how that associates with the resistance rates. The signal we started seeing is that, again, at the, at the um, antimicrobial resistance level, we were seeing an enrichment of specific antimicrobial resistance traits in specific groups, right? 
So over here, you see proteobacteria are present in both disinfected and non-disinfected systems at high level. And of course, they have some antimicrobial resistance trait associated with them. These are actinobacteria that have disproportionately higher antimicrobial resistance rates associated with them in disinfected in systems than in non-disinfected systems. If you kind of go, go down deeper into this, what we find is most of these are largely associated with mycobacterium. This comes back to these non-tuberculosis mycobacterium that are in our drinking water systems. Now, I'm not gonna say these are associated with disease because we can't, uh, uh, we, we can't make that link. But what we can say is at least within this metabolic cohort, we are seeing signals of sort of enrichment of antimicrobial resistance traits. Uh, again, maps on to the broader metabolic landscape. So uh, we, we kind of took a look at these micro, um, you know, genome bins of these microorganisms, of these mycobacteria, and most of them are rapidly growing mycobacteria from, uh, uh, from, uh, from, environmental, from environmental systems. Um, nonetheless, so, it's, so we're seeing there is one, one side of the story that tells us that you know, selection happens and selection happens towards certain lifestyles, one of them being necrotrophic, Selection happens by disinfection towards certain, certain traits that we care about, that is within organisms that we care about as well when it comes to antimicrobial resistance. So this is not the only kind of selection that's happening in the metabolic landscape, but at least I've made it, I hope I made the case that one of the most ubiquitous treatment technologies, disinfection that is used for drinking water treatment has the potential to systematically select for groups of microorganisms that have lifestyles that might be associated with how we treat that water. And that might have an importance from both an antimicrobial resistance and from a pathogen perspective. So this is why it's very important to develop a metabolic map of the drinking water microbiome. And I will, uh, you know, I'm coming close to the end. Um, okay, how much time do I have? Maybe another couple of minutes? Yeah, okay. Um, you know, so it's, it's kind of quite crucial to develop this um, metabolic map of the drinking water microbiome because I think it has the potential to inform technology selection. And, you know, so we are involved in one of these efforts where we are scouring databases from, uh, that are published, um, metagenomic databases from across the world. We are also using our own databases and trying to put, at least for now, it's an internal drinking water micro, uh, uh, genome database that we can use for a reference to understand what's happening. And what's, what's kind of, uh, I'll skip, through the, skip over the next slide, but what's actually quite interesting is that when we take all these genomes that we have put together so far, these are about close to a thousand genomes that we've put together from drinking water systems, and we cluster them based on their metabolic capacities, what you're beginning to see, is the emergence of phylogenetically coherent metabolic clusters that show up in drinking water systems all the time, <laughs> right? So there is, uh, you know, so we know that treatment processes can be selected. So this is not unexpected, but what's nice is now we can take a look at individual clusters. We can map onto them information of how often we see them. So over here, you're seeing a cluster that we, that's one of the genomes that we see quite often. Right, we might not see all of the other, and the color goes from dark to light means this genome was not seen very often in drinking water systems. This genome was seen quite often in drinking water system. But when we now think about control, we might think about control at the metabolic cluster level, right? We might, we might think about what is the capacity within this metabolic cluster that shows around drinking water system. So this is quite an active area of research for us right now is really laying the groundwork for what does what are the lifestyles of the microorganisms in drinking water systems? So why do these findings have technology implications? One example is this whole concept of necrotrophic growth, right? What this tells me is like, as long as there is microorganisms, there are microorganisms growing in the drinking water system, no matter how much we invest in organic carbon removal, if these microorganisms are specialized at reusing DK products from other microbes, you know, that's, you know, what sort of technology investment is that, right? So this, this could be, um, you know, this could help us make different choices in terms of how we treat our drinking water, you know, focus more on reducing numbers of microorganisms rather than reducing carbon available for their growth at the, at the limits of uh, carbon detection. Uh, we've also previously shown that things like filtration processes can also impact the drinking water microbiome. And I'm, I'm gonna kind of skip through this a little bit fast. This is work from way back but some of these insights on how we use 
the metabolic capacity of microorganisms to control the drinking water microbiome. You know, these lead to insights. And this is a paper from a couple of years ago now where we talked about strategies to control biofilter microbial communities. And one of the strat, and you can, you can look this up, one of the strategies is actually to use the genomic information of these microorganisms to guide process intervention. So for example, if we know that the filter sieves the drinking water microbiome and, and this infection selects, then maybe we can control the filter in such a way that what it sieves is informed by its genomic potential. That means we design a process intervention strategy that's, uh, that's governed by the metabolic model of metabolic landscape of the microbes in this biofilter. And this is a project that's going on. I don't have time to talk about it, would be happy to talk to you about a little bit. So I'm gonna end by saying that pathogen centric and not microbiome inclusive is a lost opportunity. And to go towards that, there are many different things that we need to do. In today's talk, I hope I made the case that you need to look at the metabolic landscape of the drinking water microbiome. And what's fascinating is that if you take a look at all the technologies and how much attention each technology has gotten in the drinking water field, the one technology that actually exploits microbial communities which is biofiltration is woefully understudied compared to technologies such as disinfection, membrane, and UV that are meant to remove microorganisms. So since we've focused on pathogens, we focus on technologies to eliminate these microbial communities. If we move towards a microbiome perspective, then maybe we start developing new biofiltration technologies, new approaches uh, to treat drinking water using microorganisms, or even some new technology out there that we haven't thought about, right, um, um, at all. So, you know, um, and I always, you know, it's, it's kind of fun to throw this out there, but maybe we start thinking about the drinking water microbiome from not just a safe perspective, but from a health perspective. Right? Maybe it's a healthy microbiome that we care about. And uh, if, we, if we understand the metabolic landscape, we might be able to get there. With that, I wanna thank my research group that does all the work um, and uh, the funding agencies that have been very generous in supporting our work. And I am going to stop sharing and I would love to take questions.